ever since the first album, we, we stopped doing uh, demos for anything. I haven't done a demo for a song in 30 something years. Right. Because of. No demoitis. No demoitis, and it's never as good emotionally. Right. It's better technically, it's better performance wise, it's perfect, it's everything else. Yeah. But I never can get back what we put down. And no. that happened with Wholehearted. It started with Wholehearted, which ended up being like, you know, top five single globally. And. And that was recorded. How? That was recorded. I didn't have anything to record. I was writing the song. I got my first 12-string ever. And, you know, what does any human being do when they get excited when they get something they have to go to the toilet? So I went to the toilet and I took the 12-string. I know this is too much information, so I apologize for the kids at home. But I literally was sitting on the toilet and I just wanted to play this. I never owned a 12-string. I never owned a 12-string acoustic. I've always loved it in so many different ways and Super Tramp and every, everybody that played it, right? So all of a sudden, I'm sitting there, and I'm telling you, wrote the whole song on the toilet, 10 minutes, done. The, the ideas just came pouring out amongst, <laughs> amongst other things. Were your legs asleep by yeah, the end of they, it? Yeah, they were. They were a little bit. There was a big mark right here from the guitar. But I was like, I got out. I definitely made sure to take care of myself first. Then I got out excited. And I told Gary, I got this fucking tune. You got it. This is, this is the melody. This is what it is. And we do it. And we wrote it like boom, 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 boom. But then I was like, oh, fuck. I, I need to put this down. I have really bad short-term memory. Everything is voice notes and fucking... But then it was micro cassettes. Like, I had fucking yeah. tons of them carrying around. And you had to go find ideas. It's horrible. But I, I can't remember. Like, if me and you jammed right now and, and, I, and I said to you, man, that's an incredible riff. You're like, cool, yeah. Five minutes later, you asked me to play it or sing it, gone. I have no short-term memory. So I was like, had my little four-track recorder and I, I needed a microphone for the for the 12 string. So Gary had this horrible Burger King headset mic, you know, the, the Janet Jackson model, right? So, so I'm like, it's just it's hanging there. So you got duct tape, I duct tape it to my knee. I duct tape it to my knee, put the mic there, record. The, the whole song, record it. Uh, drum machine, boom, with the, you know, with the kick drum, just kick drum. I put a tambourine in there, I'm like, great, because I was, I was thinking about Zep 3 with, I was like, oh, Zep 3, let's right. do this. It took the whole groove out of Zep 3. I actually got to tell Paige, I apologize for that, but I did it, threw it down to the bass, we did some harmonies. I couldn't do Pat's harmony too high, so I pitched it down so I could do it, and I hit the harmony, just a demo. I'm telling you, the thing took, an hour maybe. Here we are now, we're in, in LA recording porn and graffiti, and two inch tape, fucking $2,000 a day studio, you know, let's spend a quarter of a million dollars making an album. We're cutting it and we're doing it, and I'm just like, what the fuck? It's got no energy, it's got no mojo, it's got nothing. And everybody's like, oh, it sounds great, it sounds amazing. And I'm like, so I just, I fucking called home and asked somebody ship me the fucking machine. Mm -hmm. And then when nobody was in the studio, I just transferred all the tracks to two inch. Wait a minute, so that guitar, the, the, you're telling me the 12 string part on that was headset recorded mic. with the headset mic taped to taped your knee. Taped to my knee, the original. I swear to God on my children. No way. On my children's That's life. amazing. All of it, all of it is the demo, all of it. And it just goes to show you, <laughs> it went, to, it was a hit. Right? It doesn't matter how good, if it's chocolate covered shit, it's chocolate covered shit. The song's still gotta be good, no matter how poorly it sounds. But if you go back and listen to it now, it's not the greatest sounding song ever recorded. But I didn't care. Even, even the 12 strings kind of like a little, it's a little brittle. It's not like the beefy stuff that I usually do, but I'm like, and I had the new 12 string. I mean, the recording was so perfect and so amazing, but, but it just goes to show you that. And then when I put it onto the two inch, the power of suggestion, everybody, okay, look, check this out. And everybody tells like, oh fuck yeah, this is way better. Now, did you get you didn't use Gary's vocal from that though, right? From the demo. Or did you did you? Maybe. Oh my god. My point being is that we stopped making demos because every time we recorded it the first time, so on porn graffiti, the rest of the songs, everything was recorded when the label gave us pre-production money to go in and write songs. We were like, fuck it. We went into a studio, we took that money, and we recorded the album. So all the porn and graffiti, get the funk out, decadence dance, all that stuff. We recorded it with my with Bob St. John, our engineer, no producer. And we did it, and then we sent it to the label, and they were like, wow, this is amazing. Who did this? I'm like, well, we did. You know, and Nuno's like, oh, okay, well, we gotta get a producer. Like, they loved it until that's they said it was I made. know, that's all, why, why, is, why did they always do that? Because they had to have some say in the record, right? They have to have some say in the record, and they're also gonna go, we're not about to give a fucking 20, 21-year-old, even though it sounds great, 
production, like be the producer to deliver this right from top to bottom, mi- sure. everything else. And I, but I had been doing that my whole life. I just didn't know I was a producer. It's just right. what you did, right? So we, they said we got to get a producer. I said, okay, well, I do like the way Michael Wagner makes things sound. At the time, he had some cool guitar sounds with Skid mm-hmm. Row and some things. Just I was listening more selfishly, and even the drum sounds, I thought it would cool, whatever. The reason we ended up working with Michael, who is super talented, and and, and he knows his story, so I don't want to, you know, he's probably going to hear this, but when they when the head of a and called, called me back and I said, he goes, we spoke to Michael, played him the demos. And I go, what do you think? He goes, sounds amazing, but what do they need me for? And I went, hire him. Right. <laughs> because to me, a good producer, and you are a producer, you already know this, a good producer is a producer that knows when he has to step in and do 80% of everything to get things across the line, to help people play their parts, do this, sometimes even maybe play something, do whatever it's gotta take as long, it's all good. And sometimes the best producers is just to get the fuck out of the way and let it fucking happen and do 1% or maybe just mix it. And Michael just says, all I wanna do is mix this with you. I'm like, I love you. And we went out to the big studio and he came, he pretended to come in every day and then he'd leave. And then he'd leave us to our fucking, he let the inmates run the asylum and he came in and the shit was done. How was that? And and uh, and he mixed uh, he mixed and with with me at his side and uh, it worked you know there you go <laughs> and uh, but I think you know it, it, it's did you did you ever talk to Butch Vig I did yeah did he I, I think it was I, I'm not sure if it was because uh, uh, I, I I saw recently an ad for it I didn't get to watch it yet but I I thought I heard him say and maybe you can you can double down on this if he did talk to you about this but it was a long time ago that I saw a quick snippet of him on MTV or something when he said that he was going to produce the Nirvana album and they sent him something like on a cassette. Or yeah, you said they sent the demos of the, their whole, all the songs on a cassette, just yeah. distorting a cassette. Yeah, and all he, he was just, he was panicked because he said, how the fuck am I going to capture that? And, you know, like, it's almost like this, that producer going like, instead of the, the producer that pisses on everything because he wants to, like, make it his, that's a certain kind of producer, but the good producers are the ones that can adapt from artist to artist and go like, you, you know. know, Glenn Johns, when uh, Pete Townsend sent him the demo to Bob O'Reilly, he's like, how can I improve on this? Which ended up being a lot of what they, what, they actually did re-record it, I believe, but uh, he said it was sounded so good yeah. that. It's amazing, right? I, yeah. I mean, that's why you look, you got Pete Townsend going into a studio and doing shit like that. It's like, to me, the, the word that comes to mind, and maybe you agree, is a producer's job is to protect it. It's just to protect it. It's like, it's, it's I, how many times I have to tell an artist, it's like, this is great. Vocalists that want to recut this shit over and over and over, and I'm just like, and I'm just like, you can record it all you want, but that first or second take you did or whatever is here, what, you know, like, you might have cracked, you might have done this, but the emotion of it, you know, and, and even with the Cream album with Gary's vocal this time around, I really pushed him and wanted him to, like, I, I feel for me, and this is just coming from the extreme side, that this is Gary's album for me. This is the best he's ever sung. This is the, the, this is the most emotional he's ever sung. Different characters, different voices, different tones. And we pushed, we pushed a lot lyrically and, and melodically and performance-wise. Because Gary's, we're at the point now where it's like, okay, okay, rise, here we go. Does a take with the lyrics and like, you nailed it, it's perfect. But I don't believe you. Like, let's go, let's go back to that place now where those lyrics are and what they mean and, and let's fucking go. Let's go in and like, you know. And I, and I think there's an element that if you're not kind of hating your producer a lot by the end of the project, then he isn't doing his job <laughs> in a way. <laughs> You know what I mean? I think a producer has to pull things out of people that they kind of don't want to deal with, you know? That's a bridge, yeah. You know what's crazy? I wasn't until... My first concert I ever saw was Super Trap. Okay. It was Super Trap and the Breakfast in America tour, which oh, yeah. I was obsessed with that album. Which and has that, those, those, those kind of chords and... Uh, how about... In, uh, yeah, and so give a little bit. Right? It wasn't. Yeah, so it was so give yeah. a little bit, and it wasn't until uh, the end. So, whole heart is out. Yeah, you know, bridge is out. Yeah, whole. I thought that was
was the whole song. And then somebody says to me, and I was in Europe somewhere, and they go like, man, you're really influenced by Supertramp. You, you realize that on Wholehearted, you actually, you're playing a part right off of Give a Little Bit. And I'm like, I was kind of offended. I was like, what the fuck? I was eating a Snickers bar, so I almost threw it at the guy. I'm like, what do you mean? You tell me I stole it? He goes, oh, yeah. I'm like, where? He goes, play your bridge. Play, play your pre-chorus. I'm like, yeah. He goes, yeah, no, stop singing now. He goes. Isn't that the whole, isn't that the ending of the actual song? Um, talking about me. And then you go. So there's an ending of the super terms that goes. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. It's the ending of the Literally song. Literally the end. Literally, I yeah. stole the ending of the fucking song. <laughs> and I had no idea. I mean, talk about how something influences you. And I'm, I'm like playing it, because I did it in A as well, the same sort of phrasing. It was just a part to me. Yeah. But he goes, no, if you literally play it, you played the song. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I, mean, I didn't get sued, but yeah. But yeah, this was recorded. This was just literally like, if you want, we, we can go into the toilet. I can show you exactly what, ha <laughs> what happened. I'll pull my, I mean, I'll pull my, we'll do, we'll, 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 we'll revisit the whole thing. We'll recreate the whole thing. Yeah. I'll go eat some We got, we got a mic prunes. we can probably tape, tape to you that we won't use again. Yeah, use again. <laughs> but that's what it was. It was like, you know, excited for some reason. One of the things that are really magical. How do you, wait, how do you play that on the toilet though? That's, that grooving. <laughs> well, you definitely can't do this no. and you don't. But uh, I think the only problem I had, I think I played it different because I couldn't get to the wall because it had kept in the toilet paper, so I had to kind of play forward. Which, uh, <laughs> but but sometimes I don't know if this ever happened to you, but this is a rare, rare occasion. You know that shit like this happens. I mean, I mean, actual not that shit, but like this shit. I'm fuck mad. I'm like, this is not good. Toilet. Anything I say sounds like I'm taking a shit. When this shit, when this happens. When you get, a, you get a new instrument or, I don't know, you sit on the piano or something, you pick up somebody's guitar, you start, it happened with more than words and it happened with this one. Oh, wow, two hits, ironically enough. Where you actually, the first thing you play is the thing that you're creating and you don't stop. Right. It just, it's like as if, that's why, we, me and Gary wrote a song years ago called The Music Isn't Mine, meaning like we feel like when that happens, uh, other than stealing <laughs> Super Tramp, uh, but that, that, all these things just happen as if they were imprinted. What I mean by that is not just the riff. Like, I didn't just go like, oh, I'm, I'm just jamming like on a blues thing going. <laughs> so, you know, you're playing that, but then, you know, you literally go and you're like, you finish and you go. It all finishes each one, and I'm telling you, that all came in order. <laughs>